Okay, welcome everyone. We're just about to get started. Thanks to all who are coming into the meeting room today. We're very excited uh, to start today's event in just a minute or two. Uh, Dr. Gareth Dyke is joining us today. Dr. Dyke, how are you today? Absolutely fantastic. Not bad at all. How are you, Scott? Everything going well? Fantastically well. Thanks for asking. Yeah, it's a beautiful, crisp um, autumn evening here in Tokyo. Yeah, lovely. Nice and sunny here in Budapest. We have participants joining us from all around the world. So why not say hello in the chat box? If you're joining us, let us know where you're from. That would be great. Yes, welcome everyone. And um, we'll give a, just a bit of time. We'll give a minute or two for everyone to file in. And um, yeah, let's give everyone a chance to, to get in and get settled. We're talking about one of the most critical stages in the publication process today, probably the most difficult section, part of the journal publication journey. Don't you think so, Scott? People struggle a lot with finding a good journal for their papers. Absolutely. It's especially difficult if you are a non-native English speaking researcher as well. It becomes even more difficult to choose the right journal for your paper. And also we find that um, especially early career researchers struggle to assess, to self-assess the, the um, so-called value of your own paper, which really helps you in selecting a journal. So we'll talk about that tonight as well, won't we? We will. We will. We're going to talk about all these different aspects. 56,000 journals out there to choose from, potentially. Not all in one subject area, of course, but if you actually count up the number of journals that there are out there in the world, and I'm not even talking about all of the predatory journals that we'll talk about in this presentation as well, but 56,000 journals. Where do you even start to find a good one? for your next paper. So that's part of what we're going to talk about today, this evening, this morning, planning your pathway through the forest of different journals that are out there to choose from. Wonderful. Our attendees are filing in one by one. So maybe we'll give them just a maybe a half minute more to give our guests a chance to join us today. And it's also worth mentioning, Dr. Dyke, uh, you're kind enough to make time to answer some questions at the end, I think. So I invite our guests to uh, think of any questions that you'd like to ask, and you can either ask them in the uh, questions box or you can type them in the chat window. We'll get them either way. And uh, we welcome your questions for uh, Professor Dyke. Anything to do with journal selection, choosing journals, um, we welcome all questions tonight. Fantastic. Yeah, we'll give you contact information as well. We'll give you ways to get in touch with us after the event. So if you're feeling nervous about asking a question or perhaps asking a question in English is difficult, don't worry. You can always get in touch with us after the event as well. Right, Scott? That's absolutely right. So if we were not able to answer your questions by the end of the event today, um, reach out to us. We're always happy to help with any questions that you might have. Yeah, and everybody listening to this gets access to a certificate, of course, a recording of the event, of course. So it's all good. And thank you so much once again, everybody, for, for joining us today. Um, this is a SciTrain presentation in partnership with Bentham Science Publishers. I think we're ready to kick off now. What do you think, Dr. Dyke? Shall we get started? Absolutely. Absolutely. We're just a few minutes past the top of the hour or the bottom of the hour, if you're listening to us in India, for example. Very confused always by that particular time difference back to Europe. But there we go. <laughs> Great. Well, I think we're ready to get started. Sure. Let's, let's uh, kick her off. All right, brilliant. We're going to talk today, as we've already been mentioning, about journal selection, which is probably the most difficult or problematic stage in the publication process. So let's get going. Journal selection. Let's talk about that critical first step in the publication process. Just a few housekeeping remarks as we get started. 
We are Bentham Science Publishers. Bentham, of course, as you are very well aware, is a leading scientific, technical and medical research publisher with more than 160, 166 to be precise, online and print journals for you to choose from as a writing and publishing researcher. And that breaks down to 126 hybrid journals. So those are the traditional journals that exist in print or online form completely free of charge to researchers as well as 40 open access journals we also publish more than 1300 online and print books if you're an author or a prospective author have a look at bentham books because publishing an ebook surprisingly easy surprisingly fast and surprisingly cheap and we also provide a number of information solutions for researchers around the world in various scientific disciplines. And Bentham, of course, a member of the COPE Committee on Publication Ethics. If you're listening to this and you're a librarian, well, great to see you. Thanks for joining us. Give this QR code a scan, a quick scan there with your phone. You'll be able to get your institution's library free access to Bentham content for three months with absolutely no obligation. You can register for a free three month trial, complete access to the whole catalog, including by the way, 40 impact factor journals, 40 or more. In fact, the number at Bentham now is above 60 journals with impact factors from the last Clarivate impact factor release that came out earlier this year. So you can also join our mailing list, get updated on new articles that are added to your favorite journals every month and expand your library's content and expand the reach of the fantastic journals that your researchers have access to. We'll show you this QR code again at the end. We'll come back with more information about Bentham a little bit later in our event today. We're going to be talking, Scott and I, about two things relating to journal selection today in this training event. And thank you very much for joining us. Journal selection before writing your next paper. Very important, as you'll see in this training, one of the things that we do highly recommend for efficiency as a writing and publishing researcher is to think about your journal target before you begin to write. That really will save a lot of time, a lot of energy, and make the whole process much, much, much more efficient. And then also we'll talk about journal selection before submission. So two key aspects of the journal selection journey in this presentation today. And we're going to start off with before you begin to write. Now, when I was working as a researcher, more than 20 years I spent on the hamster wheel as an academic researcher, I always used to make the very, very common mistake of writing my paper and then thinking, where am I going to submit this paper? Which journal am I going to choose for my article that's now completely written? And as you'll see in this presentation, doing it that way round, writing the paper and then thinking, where am I going to submit it, is not the most efficient it's not the most effective. It's not the most time efficient use of your research time. It's not the way in which you'll get your research most effectively published in those leading international journals like Bentham, for example. So why journal selection? What we're talking about in this training is helping you as a researcher understand the difference between different kinds of academic journals, different types, different ways of assessing academic journals in order that you can make the best possible choice for your next research article. Of course, universities around the world assess researchers like you, like me, based on the kinds of publications that we end up producing. So putting time into selecting a good journal that's going to maximize your publication potential, your reach, your readership, and also your professional development at your institution is very, very important. Journal selection is critical 
because picking a good journal can speed up the publication of your paper. It can maximize the impact of your paper, of your publication, of course, very, very important. We want to write papers so that other researchers will read them, other researchers will cite them, policymakers will use them, lawmakers, people interested in the socioeconomic benefits of our research, and also big, big problem, as we'll talk about a little bit later in this presentation, picking a good journal means avoiding one of the very many fake, predatory, problematic journals and publishers that are out there these days. So you don't want to fall into the trap of publishing your research that you've spent all that time and energy, maybe money, on creating, on developing, on collecting data, only to see the work published in a less than reputable outlet. So that's also very important. I mentioned 56,000 at the beginning of this presentation when we were chatting with Scott at the outset. There are 56,000 journals out there in the world being published by different publishers. And by the way, most of those 56,000 journals are actually published by individual universities, individual societies, or smaller publishers. The big publishers like Bentham only publish about 30 to 40 percent of the overall market in terms of numbers of journals. So there are lots of journals out there that you may never have heard of. There are lots of journals out there potentially in your field that could be used by you as a researcher to make an impact, get your research out there and seen by the world. But as you're a sunflower amongst a field of daisies, you want to make sure that your publications stand out. And picking a good journal as the first step in that journey is very, very important. You could publish your research in a journal that nobody's ever heard of, nobody's ever going to read. And then, of course, the work will not be seen. The work will not be cited. You won't achieve your potential. You won't maximize the output of your research. So what we'll do now, just to kind of make sure that everybody's still awake and still with us in the Zoom room, is we'll hand back over to Scott and we'll ask you a couple of quick questions. What do we think? How are we doing, Scott? Great. It's a great time for a poll, Gareth. Thank you. And um, apologies in advance. Our poll functionality is not working great today, but we'll give it a try. So I'm going to launch a poll here. And the question is about journal selection. So our question is, when is the best time to select a journal for your paper? Well, you probably already heard our introduction from Dr. Dyke. Let's try the poll anyway. Do you think the best time to write, excuse me, the best time to select a journal is before writing? Or do you feel the best time is while writing your manuscript? Or is the best time to select a journal after writing your manuscript? Okay, let's see what our attendees said today. I hey, always, always, always used to really, really, really not put any time into this at all. So I'm interested in the results of this survey. Journal selection, I never bothered with it, really. Very common mistake. Let's see what our guests said today. Okay, great. Looks like many of our guests heard our intro today. So about 65% of our guests today said before. Nice. About 6% said the best time is while writing. And about 29% said after writing your manuscript. And we should say, we don't want to scare you into thinking if you've already finished your paper, we don't want you to think that it's not possible for you to choose the best journal. It's not that at all. It's just that there are more efficient or optimum times to select the journal. And we find that that's before writing. And we'll go through some of the reasons why before writing is the best time, not the only time, but maybe the most efficient time to select a journal for your paper. Back to you, Professor. It's also really important to think about like, maybe lining up a few journals before you begin to write or having a target journal in mind, because um, this will help. Yeah, and we can see the results of the poll there. That's absolutely fantastic. Yeah, about 65% of our um, guests today are agreeing with us that the best time to do this is before writing the manuscript. And of course, many people do this while they're writing as well. But we would say from experience, 
try to think about a target journal before you begin to write, because in part, this also helps with many of the common questions that colleagues have about writing and publishing. People always ask us how much information should go into the introduction? What should I put into the abstract? What should my figure captions look like? What should my discussion, my methods and results, what should I put into those sections? Well, if you have a target journal lined up, you can answer many of those questions before you begin the process. And you can see how successful writing and publishing academics do it, how they put together those different bits of their papers. So of course, the best time to write, the best time to select a journal, of course, is before you start to write your manuscript. And the reason for that is that every journal's different. You might be writing, you might be targeting a different kind of paper to a different journal. A review paper might only be publishable in a certain kind of journal. A protocol might only be publishable in a certain kind of journal that publishes those kinds of things, or clinical trials, for example, only published in certain kinds of journals. So do have a think about this. Do target your research to a particular journal based on what your key outcomes are, based on the message of your paper. And so that requires some self-evaluation, that requires some thought, that requires some understanding of the key message of your research. And that comes with experience. As you get more experienced as a researcher, you're often able to decide, well, this result that I've come up with would be most suitable or could be targeted at this particular high impact factor journals. And of course, you'll get to know the kinds of journals in your field. You'll learn about their aims and scope, what readership they have, the disciplines and topics that are encompassed by particular journals, and you'll get to know their guidelines, their general procedures, their peer review process, which journals use single blind or double blind or transparent peer review, the formatting, word limits, kinds of copyright restrictions, and also even minor nitty gritty details like the kind of English that would be used in a particular journal. So of course, very, very, important. And we would say, as I've already mentioned, that when thinking about your target journal, you need to know about those three fantastic bits of information before starting to write. It would be great to have these pieces of information ready before you start to write. Your message, your audience, and your article structure. As you learn about putting the important information from your research, into your target journal selection. If you've finished a piece of research, you'll learn to develop, perhaps by listening to some of our other training courses, about the key message of that research. Your audience, of course, is your journal target, and much of the information about the structure of your writing comes from that target journal. Of course, we do recommend that you communicate with editors. You set up that publication by talking to editors, writing pre-submission inquiries to journal editors before making submissions. So you might have a list of journals, some examples shown here on the slide, that could be suitable targets for your next piece of research. You've got a list of key journals that you could be aiming your paper at. The next step then would be to write pre-submission inquiries to editors at those journals. Of course, we can give you a template for doing that at the end of this session, but you would then send off five or 10 or 15 or 20 emails to editors at journals and ask them whether or not they think that your piece of research would be suitable for potential consideration in their journal, in their publication. And you can think about impact in terms of that publication strategy as well. The different kinds of research impact that we're trying to achieve as researchers, it's not just about the impact factor, the impact of the journal. It's not just about your academic 
impact. Of course, that's very important, but we also will be thinking as researchers about the economic and societal benefits of our research publications as well, because we want people to use our research as well as citing it. So you might, in some situations, prefer to target a journal that is owned by a society potentially, because the members of that society will be people that you want to target with that particular research. So reach with your journal selection as a researcher can be just as important as impact factor as you think about how you can maximize your impact as a researcher. And here are some examples of how you can self-evaluate your research. If you're not sure that your journal is too good or it's good enough for a paper that you're preparing to write, you can use this quick checklist that we've put together here to critically evaluate your study. You think about how novel your paper is within a known context. How good are your methods? The study design, the data analysis. Have you minimized bias to maximize your study's validity and readability, for example? What are the real world implications of your work? What will the influence of your study be and over what time scale? Is your study ethically compliant? Of course, it absolutely should be. And is your writing highly readable and suitable for non-specialist readers? As you target your work to journals with higher impact factors, the readership of those journals becomes more and more broad, more general. So you've got to write potentially in such a way that your work will be more easily understandable at those higher impact factor journals. So let's have a quick think about doing this, targeting journals, and let's hand back over to Scott and think about pre-submission inquiries. Scott? Fantastic. Thank you, Gareth. And another poll for our guests today. So just a moment ago, uh, Dr. Dyke mentioned pre-submission inquiries, and we're going to talk about that in just a minute. But first, let's find out how much you know about sending pre-submission inquiries to journal editors. So quiz question for you today, how many pre-submission inquiries are you able to send to journals? Now, again, this is before your formal submission, but for pre-submission inquiries, is the answer A, only one at a time? Let's launch our poll here. One pre-submission inquiry at a time, or B, up to three pre-submission inquiries at a time, or unlimited pre-submission inquiries. How many are you able to send? Let's see what our guests think today. It's hey, so interesting. In. Yeah. Well, it's higher impact factor journals encourage you to do this. They actually want you to do this. They don't want millions and millions of submissions. So higher impact factor journals want you to do this. But we're we're advocating that all journals, all submissions, you should be looking at doing a pre-submission inquiry to speed up the efficiency of your journal submission process. Great. Let's take a look at our results. So 40% of our guests said you can only send one at a time. Now, that's true for formal, for actual journal submissions, but for pre-submission inquiries, that's actually not true. It's not just one at a time. It's not just three at a time. It's truly unlimited. And as Professor Dyke just said, journal editors welcome this. They don't want to be overwhelmed with um, inappropriate or, or um you know, submissions that don't match their aims and scope and don't match the journal, they would rather you reach out to them first with a pre-submission inquiry and just find out if what you're writing is suitable for their readers and for their for their journal. So congrats to those who chose the third option, unlimited. It's truly unlimited how many pre-submission inquiries you can send. And keep in mind, this is different, very different from actual submissions for which you can only send one at a time. We'll give you a template for doing this at the end of the event. And it really is a great strategy. I wish I'd known about this much earlier in my academic career, to be honest, because you can send 20 pre-submission inquiries to different journal editors with a piece of work that you are working on, maybe with the abstract, maybe with the title, maybe with some of the key outcomes from the study and ask them if they would be interested in receiving that submission. And some might not reply, of course. 
Some might say nothing. They might not get back to you. Or they may get back to you and say, it's not suitable for our journal, but we've got another journal in our family, you know, that, that would be, you know, suitable for this particular submission. Or they might say, great, thanks for the pre-submission inquiry, Scott, thank you so much. We'd love to see that submission coming into our journal. And you know what? Then you're actually ahead of the game. Then you're actually inside the editor's mind. You've actually got one step closer to that successful publishing experience. So speed up your journal selection process by sending pre-submission inquiries. Write to editors, as many as you like, target that journal effectively, give them information about the study, give them the abstract and title if you've got it. So these are all tips and tricks from us at SciTrain at Bentham Science Publishers for selecting a journal effectively before you begin to write your paper. Let's talk now a little bit about what to do in terms of journal selection before making that submission to the journal, before making that final submission to your journal of choice. And what we do at Bentham is we talk to authors all the time, all around the world. And so what we've done is we've discovered that generally speaking, authors are looking at impact factor. Of course they are. They're looking at reputation of a journal and they're looking at the journals of reach within a field. There are lots of examples of journals from that 56,000 that we've talked about, all of those journals out there in the world that are well-known and well-respected within an individual field, but that may not have such an absolutely fantastic impact factor. Medical journals are good examples. There may be very well-respected journals within your particular field of medical sciences, health sciences, that everybody in your sub-discipline reads, but that may not have such fantastic impact factors. That's why reputation is important to researchers within particular subfields, as well as open access. And we're going to talk about open access in a moment, but effective journal selection is all about marrying your research and your publication success. So researchers around the world, they're obviously looking for speed. They want to publish their papers as fast as possible. Nobody wants to be sitting around for months and months and months for papers to get published. They want impact, impact factors, and they also want high reach and readership, which of course are all interrelated. The more readers a journal tends to have, the higher its impact factor. A journal like Nature or Science with a huge impact factor has a huge readership as well. So that is also very, very important. The different things that researchers look for when selecting a journal. And you will also be going through this process yourself as an academic, as a researcher. We think about which factor is most important to you. Is it the aims and scope, the article length, publication speed and frequency, the indexing, whether the journal is print, online, or fully open access, and also the acceptance rate, the criteria like speed of publication, kind of peer review. And these are all the kinds of information that we can help you discover or that you can find on your journal website. So do have a think about these different kinds of factors when selecting a journal for your next research. And in terms of impact factor, people often ask us about this. We've put down here on this slide a number of different kinds of impact factors that are important to researchers. The ones you've probably heard of most often and that will be most important to you potentially are impact factor itself, which can be a researcher's impact factor, a journal's impact factor, or even an individual publication's impact factor. Journal impact factors, and remember I talked about Bentham Science and all of those 60 journals with fantastic impact factors in the latest Clarivate release from earlier this year. This is a measure of the number of citations in that journal 
over the last two years, divided by the number of articles that that journal has published. So if we think about one of the Bentham journals with an impact factor of five, for example, current neuropharmacology, one of the leading Bentham journals in that field has an impact factor of just over five. That means that five is the number that's arrived at when the number of citations within the last two years is divided by the number of articles. It's a measure of the journal's reach and reputation within the field. An H index, an H number, often applied to individual researchers is a measure of your publication output, your publication impact. So a researcher with an H index of 10, for example, has published 10 papers that have been cited themselves at least 10 times. So it's a maximum measure of your publication impact, your number of publications, the maximum number with the maximum number of citations. And of course, we're happy to answer any questions about this a little bit later on in our event today. Impact factors are important, but also we get lots of questions from researchers about the different kinds of journals. And this slide provides you with a summary of the main different kinds of academic journals. We talked about this in the context of Bentham Science a little bit earlier. We've got about 120, 126 traditional journals in which you can publish for free. Those are the kinds of journals where you used to walk off down to the library when you were younger like me and have a look at the most recent journals that had appeared in your university library. Publishers make money on these traditional journals by selling the content back to universities and to libraries, etc. So the content is behind a paywall. You've got to be within your university system, within a subscription system to get access to that content, but there's no cost to researchers to publish in those journals. Those are called traditional journals. On the other side of the coin are our fully open access or gold open access journals, where the research once peer reviewed and published is fully open, fully accessible to all, fully open access, but there's a charge to the researcher who wishes to publish in those kinds of journals. That's a gold open access journal. There's often what we call an article processing charge associated with those kinds of articles. Green open access, that's where you've gotten your paper accepted in a traditional journal, let's say Nature or Nature Communications or current neuropharmacology. In the case of Bentham, your paper's been accepted. You put a version of that paper, maybe the final submitted version, not the final published version, but the very last version in the peer review system onto your website or onto a site like ResearchGate, where other people can see it and they can download it. You're not putting the full final version online, but you're putting a very, very late stage revision onto um, an archive, onto your website, and that's freely accessible. That's called green open access. And we talk about this in events like this because researchers have lots of questions about especially open access publishing. So let's ask you a question about open access publishing. Scott, open access publishing, confusing or everything is absolutely clear and straightforward. Right, well, we're going to talk a little bit about preprints as one example. And here is a poll on copyrights. This is a question that a lot of people ask us about preprints. So let's see what our audience thinks. When you publish on a preprint server, generally, do you keep the copyrights, A, or only some of the copyrights, B, or do you give up your copyrights when you publish on a preprint server, C? Let's see what our audience thinks today, Gareth. Answers are coming in hot very important question because one of the key concerns that actually is a situation that you face in traditional journal publishing is that very often you have to sign over that copyright to the publisher. I mean, maybe you've been in that situation where you've got that copyright transfer form in front of you, your paper's been accepted. The final stage is signing over the copyright 
to the publisher. And that's something that researchers don't often think about all that much. But of course, you publish a paper in a traditional journal, you don't own the copyright anymore. Okay, answers uh, still coming in. I think we've got most of our poll answers in now. So let's take a look at the results. 69% of our guests today said you keep all the copyrights. 19% you keep only some. And 13% said that you give up all your copyrights. Professor Dyke, what's the correct answer here? Well, if you publish your work open access or you publish it on a preprint server, then actually you keep the copyright. And that's one of the key advantages of open access publishing. And one of the things that researchers, when they learn about it, they really like. But often people don't realize this big difference between traditional publishing and open access publishing. In open access publishing, you keep the copyright, which of course means that you can do things with it a little bit later. We have some examples potentially of how I might use my copyright in future publications. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But what if you wanted to write a textbook, for example? Or what if you were going to commercialize that piece of research in the future? When you publish on a preprint server, you obviously get to keep all of the copyrights. Preprints are very important, very cool, very um, not new, actually. They've been around for more than 30 years, but they're um, a good way for researchers to both share their work early in the publication process and also keep hold of the copyright. These are often complete research papers shown to the public before peer review and before publication in a journal. There are a number of author concerns about the use of preprint servers like copyright. And it's very important to realize that you're actually better protected if you put your work onto a preprint platform. And you can see some examples of them down here on the bottom of the slide, eLife, Research Square, BioArchive, MedArchive, the original preprint server, which is just called Archive, dating back more than 30 years. Now, your work gets stamped with a Creative Commons license. You own the copyright. Nobody can do anything with that content that you've published, that you've put onto a preprint server. So it may be something to think about. We often do recommend this to researchers around the world as a way of sharing quickly your research with the wider open community. And of course, open access, very important. Open access publishing ensures that your publications are accessible to everyone. And this could include all of your data, your results, your conclusions, and sometimes peer review as well. There's a big movement these days towards making peer review comments, peer review open and accessible online as well. And of course, there's been a huge change in researchers' perceptions of the peer review process and preprinting in particular as a direct result of the COVID-19 pandemic. This gave us all a very clear demonstration of why it's so important to put out research results, research data as quickly as possible and not necessarily have to wait for peer review and for those articles to appear in full traditional journals. We would still be dealing with a lot of the issues that we faced during the COVID pandemic if we'd had to wait a lot more time for research to be published in traditional journals. So in summary, gold open access, that's where your research is published in a full open access journal, Biomed Central Plus, for example. Bentham Open is our open access arm at Bentham Science Publishers with more than 40 fully open access journals for you to choose from. And we talked already about what green open access publishing means, what green open access is all about. So do have a think about this when selecting your next journal target, because we've got these three rules for journal selection. Aiming high, choosing appropriately, and then learning to sell and manage your submissions. And of course, we are here at Scitrain to provide training in all of these different areas. So if you feel that you or your institution or your research group 
potentially would benefit from additional training in any of the areas that we cover in these webinars, journal selection in particular. In this case, do get in touch with Scott and I. We would love to show up online at your university and provide more training or indeed give you a menu of training options that we can provide. Picking a journal, often people look for tools to do that. Big shout out to Edants because they have probably the best journal selection tool out there at the moment that is publisher independent. So if you're looking for a place where you can go and enter some keywords, enter your article abstract and get a list of potential journals that you could use for your next publication, Edance, the Edance journal selector tool is a great choice. You'll find it in seconds on a quick online search, the Edance journal selector tool. It's the only one that is publisher independent at the moment. So very good as a place to go. Watching out for fake journals is very important as well. Of course, many journals, many publishers taking advantage of this open access model where there's a cost to authors to put their papers into a fully open access journal. An article processing charge is levied. So this has, of course, led to a dodgy business model where publishers and journals that aren't really following proper peer review or not bothering with it at all are offering publication for a fee. They will try to cheat you out of your money and out of your research. It's getting more and more difficult to spot some of these predatory publishers and some of these predatory journals. Be aware of this. Lots of researchers get caught out every year, even from some of the biggest research institutions in the world. Spotting a fake predatory journal. Have a look at the website. Is the URL strange? Are there obvious errors? Indexing a reputable journal. The Bentham Science Journals, for example, are listed in well-known indexes like the Directory of Open Access Journals, Scopus, Clarivate, Cabells, PubMed, and so on. Predatory journals won't be listed in these databases. Keep that in mind as well. Who's on the editorial board? Do you recognize their names? Do you recognize them from your field? Is the journal publishing regularly? Is it publishing on time? Are its articles properly peer reviewed? Do the articles that this journal's publishing match with the journal aim and scope and fees. Very important to keep in mind that a reputable publisher will never charge you anything until after your paper has been accepted. So no submission fees, no peer review fees, only after acceptance. So a big red flag, an immediate red flag is if your publisher, your journal is asking for fees before publication and spamming with emails. Very common as well. We all get these kinds of emails all of the time. Watch out for that as an author. Keys and clues to spot a fake journal. Real journals, reputable journals, journals like those published by Bentham Science are listed in indexes and databases that we've all heard of. Cope, OASPA, in apps and so on and so forth. The journal has and uses a robust peer review process and the fees are fair, clearly listed and explained in detail and never charged before peer review and acceptance. A few links here on the slides. We'll send you this presentation, of course, at the end of our event today. Think, check, submit. Great resource to have a look and see if the journal that's just emailed you an invitation to submit a paper is really above board, watertight, and a good place to go. Publicationethics.org as well, and some links there to major databases of open access journals, the Directory of Open Access Journals, the DWAJ, as I like to call it, and OASPA there as well. Do have a look at those resources if you're thinking about selecting a journal for your next submission. A quick word on Beale's list. This is Jeffrey Beale there. He used to be a librarian at the University of Colorado, hence the fantastic mountainous background in his lovely photo. He set up a database almost 20 years ago now. It's been defunct. It's been frozen since the mid 
1990s. It's still out there online, of course, but he set up a database, the first of its kind, listing journals and publishers where he thought there were issues. Of course, we don't use it anymore. It's been frozen in time since maybe, maybe seven or eight years. It's worth knowing about, though, of course, but it was shut down in 2017 because of complaints, threats of legal action from several publishers. And some publishers were wrongly put on the list, which is now frozen in time, Bentham being one example. Maintained and controlled by just one guy, University of Colorado librarian Jeffrey Beale. We mention it to be completely open, to be completely fair. The successor to Beale has been a company called Cabell's. C-A-B-E-L-L. -L. Cabell's publishes a blacklist and a whitelist of journals, and they sell those contents, they sell those lists to libraries around the world. We are delighted to note that all of the Bentham Science journals are listed on the Cabell's whitelist. So any questions about that? We are delighted to talk more at the end of this presentation. Be ethical. As a researcher, of course, we have other presentations, Scott and I, about ethics in writing and publishing. Again, we will be delighted to come along online, pop up at your university and give presentations in these areas as well. Avoid ghost authorship. That's where someone who did lots of work writing a paper is not included as an author. And also avoid gift authorships. This happens often in academic publishing, of course, where somebody who did not contribute to an article is nevertheless included as an author, your boss, the director of a research group or institute. It's very common, especially in papers written by early career researchers, but is it ethical? We've got guidelines, the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors, the fantastically acronymed ICMJE. Have a look at their website if you need any further support or help with publication ethics. And with that, I think it's time to just quickly say that in our presentation today, we've talked about journal selection before writing your next paper, as well as during the submission process, before you go ahead and submit it to a journal. Our journal selection training. Let me remind you again of the fantastic Bentham QR code, if you're a librarian and you'd like to get access to all of the Bentham content for your library for the next three months, just go ahead and scan the QR code on the screen in front of you. And with that, I will share the Bentham Science social media and hand back over to Scott, my dear friend Scott, in case there are any questions or comments from our audience joining us today. Thank you so much. Thanks, Gareth. We do have a couple of questions coming in from our guests. I think we've got time for a couple of questions. Yeah. Um, first uh, question is from actually from a couple of our guests have asked us if we can explain a bit more clearly the difference between gold and green open access journals. I know this can be very confusing. Can we give it another try and explain the difference between those two types? Yeah, sure. So a gr green open access is where let's imagine that you've got your paper accepted in a journal. I mean, name your journal, but let's say Nature, right? Which is a journal that is predominantly publishing content in a traditional way. So you've got to have a subscription to access that content. But I'm allowed as a researcher to put a final stage version of that paper, of my paper, onto my own website or onto a site like ResearchGate. So I'm making my research, I'm making my results, my article available to anybody, not quite the final version, but a good enough version, certainly a version that can be used because it's the final manuscript that got accepted by nature. That can go on my website, that can go on ResearchGate, that can go on academia, you name it, your archive, that's okay. Different publishers may have different time limits on when you're allowed to do that, but nevertheless, you're making your work open. You're making your work open access. You're just doing it in a slightly different way. So that's green open access. Gold, full open access, 
is where the final version, the published version of your paper is open and accessible to everybody. So sometimes you pay for that at your hybrid journals. Nature, for example, you can pay a fee. It's about $11,000 to make your article full gold open access. Or you can go to an open access journal like Frontiers, like MDPI, like PLOS, for example, like Bentham Open, where you'll be charged an article processing charge, an APC, your paper will be fully online and fully gold open access. I hope that helps. That explanation is clearer. Please ask if you have any further questions, of course. Great. Thank you, Professor. And thanks for your question. Uh, and uh, another question coming in. We've got time for one more, I think. Do we, Gareth? Uh, this is a question um, from one of our guests, uh, uh, Isato. I think I'm, I'm saying that correctly, I hope. The question is, what is the difference between a cloned journal and a fake journal? Wow, great question. What's the difference between a cloned journal and a fake journal? Well, a cloned journal, I think, is a kind of fake journal, but that's a great question. And we're going to have to check on the answer to that and get back to you with a proper response, like after the webinar today. Of course, a fake journal is a journal that's just a made up journal. So I could create a journal today. I could call it the, you know, the Cytrain Journal of Science. I could launch a website and I could invite submissions from researchers around the world, but I'm not interested in doing peer review. I'm not interested in really publishing the content properly. I'm just interested in getting money. So I might start an email campaign, a social media marketing campaign, inviting researchers to submit to the Cytrain Journal of Science, publication fee, $500. And that's what I'm trying to really get my hands on, that money, and that's an exploitation of this open access article publishing business model. And there are many examples of journals that do that. And you've got to watch out for it as a researcher, because, of course, if you publish with a predatory fake journal, your research is online. It's published. You can't publish it somewhere else. So you're wasting an opportunity as a writing and publishing researcher. So that's a fake journal, an example of a fake journal. And we'll get back to you with a specific response about cloned journals. Okay, thank you for the great question. Thank you so much. Great question. And I have seen examples of fake journals where they, speaking of cloned journals, they'll take portions of known journals and then sort of copy or clone them. It might be the board from this particular journal or, you know, the journals from that one. Of course, the URL is different, but it looks quite similar to the actual journal. Maybe that's what um, our guest was asking about, that type of clone journal. But we'll get a proper answer for you and, and get back to you after the event. It's a great question. It's a great question. And another quick, uh, oh, here's a question from one of our guests. It was a uh, link to the Edons journal selector tool. Sure, I'll put that in the chat window right now. It is a great tool. Uh, I put the URL in the chat window. And we've got a raised hand from uh, Clara. Clara, um, Let's get Clara. Are you are you willing and able to talk on the microphone, Clara? I'll just uh, I'll unmute you here if you want to ask a question or if you wanted to type uh, a question. Feel free to do that, whichever you prefer. Okay. Good day, everybody. Hi, Clara. Sorry, mine is not a question. Can you hear me, please? Yes. Okay. Yes. Sorry, my request is um, whether the lecture or the topic can be sent to individual learn. Um, email because my next work is actually fluctuating. I missed out in most of the the connection you mean? If your connection's been going in and out. Um I think you're asking if we'll send the recording. We will send the recording to everybody that's registered for this event. So Clara, don't worry, you'll get an email in the not too distant future containing a, a recording of this presentation. So hopefully that Hopefully that helps. Um, yeah, and um, uh, thank you for that. That's great. Great, thank you. Uh, thanks for your question, Clara. And we did get a similar question from a couple of other guests as well in the chat window. So don't worry, anyone who's looking for a recording, we will send it to you. I think it goes out 
um, exactly 24 hours after we end the event. So just check your inbox in exactly 24 hours and you'll see um, a link to the recording of the event tonight. And we'll also include a link to that template for the pre-submission inquiries that uh, uh, Dr. Dyke was talking about earlier. So check your inbox in, in exactly one day. We'll have a recording and a template for you. Thanks for your question, Clara. We have another one that I can see from Moise Matacone. Sorry for the pronunciation. <laughs> uh, can a manuscript stay definitively in the preprints without publication in a journal? Yes, yes. You can preprint something and you can leave it there on Archive or Research Square or eLife. It doesn't ever have to go into a journal. Of course, if it does go to a journal, it then gets fully peer reviewed and published. The two are linked together. So the preprint and the final journal publication are linked together, potentially on the website of the journal, on your website, also often on the preprint platform. And it's part of the whole open science, open research process. So somebody else in your field can see the earlier stages of the evolution of the development of your particular research article. So people like it because they can see, well, this is the final published version, but I want to see like what that version looked like before it got peer reviewed or what the peer review comments were like, how the peer review comments improved the paper. So that's a great question. Um, and yes, the answer is yes, you can preprint and then you can do nothing else. You can just put your work onto a preprint platform. Okay, great question. Uh, we've got time for one more, Gareth, before we sign off today. Are we okay? Here's a question from our guest, uh, Katie. Katie asks, how to make sure that your manuscript meets the research scope of the journal? Well, the easiest answer would be, obviously, to review their aims and scope carefully. But more specifically, Dr. Dyke, is there something that we should look for as authors to make sure that we are within the scope of that journal? Yeah, great question. I mean, the, perhaps the best way is to is to have a look at other papers that have been published in that journal um, over the last few years. I mean, that's a good tactic anyway, as an author. I mean, imagine if you get rejected um, with a submission that's out of scope, but you've already collected five or six papers that were recently published in that journal that are the same kind of topic as yours. I mean, that used to happen to me quite often. I could then write to the editor and say, hey, like my paper's not out of scope. Here's X, Y, and Z publications that I've seen recently in your journal that are in scope just as much as my article is, you know? So yeah, definitely a very good way of checking that is just to have a look at what the journal's been publishing recently and, and then make sure that your work, you know, fits based on that kind of, Cross comparison. Absolutely. That's a great, great question. Thank you for that question. Excellent question. And we can add that to the list of things to self-assess as we're trying to select a journal as well. And that's also a great way to assess the novelty of your work is putting in the context of other papers that have been published in similar journals. So. Fantastic. Well, thanks for all of your questions, everyone. Um, Gareth, Professor Dyke, thank you so much for your time today. As always, very enlightening. I always learn so much from joining these events with you. And to our guests tonight, I hope that you also came away with some useful, actionable information from our talk today. Uh, Professor, anything to, to finish with for our guests today? No, just to say that this is Cytrain, working on behalf of Bentham Science Publishers. Do have a look at the Bentham uh, social media links. And also have a look at Cytrain. We've got lots of content, lots of courses lots of opportunities for training for researchers around the world. And thanks very much, Scott, for staying up late in the Japan evening to, to, to take control of this event today. Have a great evening. Thanks, Professor, and thanks to our guests. Have a, a great day, great evening, everyone.